Hello, welcome. Welcome to this webinar on Iran's economy under sanctions and the outlook for 2022. My name is Karen Young, and I'm a senior fellow and director of the program on economics and energy at the Middle East Institute. It's a pleasure today to be hosting this webinar in partnership with Amwash Media. We have three speakers for you today. We'll have uh, remarks opening from uh, Muhammad Ali Shabani, who is the editor at Amwash Media. Then uh, Bijan Kajapur, who uh, is a columnist uh, at Amwash and also has his own um, strategic consulting company, Eurasian Nexus Partners. And then we'll hear from Rachel Ziemba, who is a member of our advisory council on the program on economics and energy at MEI, and also uh, the, the uh, founder of her own company, uh, Ziemba Insight. So it's really a pleasure to have all three of you with us today. Um, I'm most excited because we're going to stick to, um, you know, to data. We're going to talk about what's going on in Iran's economy. Um, you know, this has been the story of the resilient economy, a diversified economy within an oil and gas producer. Um, but the outlook is getting more difficult. And so I want to hear uh, from the experts and then hear about uh, the impact of sanctions and then what scenarios for going forward really look like. And let's be um, very realistic about those scenarios. So first, I'm going to hand it to uh, Mohammed. He's going to give us some remarks on, um, on that process and uh, the sort of um, implications of sanctions currently. And then we'll move to uh, Bijan's presentation. So over to you, Mohammed, and thank you for partnering with us. Hi, Karen. Uh, I hope everyone hears me and I have no issues with my audio. Uh, I really wanted to extend my thank you to the Middle East Institute and the whole team for organizing this timely seminar. And uh, as you said, I'll try to keep it as data driven as possible. Having said that, I think we should begin by, the, by asking the fundamental questions. What, what are these sanctions meant to achieve, right? And just in terms of monetary terms, what do you really want to achieve by it? Um, I think the number one thing to look at is what has the damage been so far under Rouhani's second term following the 2018 US withdrawal from the JCPOA under Trump? Uh, in private correspondence with the EU leaders and the remaining signatories to the JCPOA, Rouhani, as early as 2019, started warning about catastrophic damage and started talking about compensation. And the reason I bring this up is because this remains a key element of the current discussion going on about the revival of the JCPOA. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about compensation and how they're going to come up with mechanisms to prevent uh, a recurrence of another withdrawal down the line if they do manage to come to an agreement. So the actual damage in the correspondence as stated, is 200 billion US dollars. This is quite significant for a country that currently right now estimated oil exports in the budget is between 10 and $12 billion, right? So we're talking about almost 20 years of oil exports. Um, and the second thing to look at is the stated or declared reason for the sanctioning of the Iranian economy by Trump at the time was to quote unquote, cut off uh, Iran's ability to uh, implement his regional policy. So when looking at the regional policy, I think also it's important to look at the data. Um, one of the things that Trump administration did interestingly was that they kind of uh, bundled up together uh, Iran's co collaboration with Syria, with, with Iraq, et cetera, with different groups there, uh, together with the credit lines that were extended to the Assad regime. So the figures that they put out at the time uh, was that Iran has spent 16 billion US dollars in the region uh, since the emergence of the Arab Spring in 2012. Um, and breaking it down per year at that point uh, would come down to about 2.2 billion US dollars, which at the time, prior to the Trump's reimposition of sanctions, amounted to 0.5% of GDP. And if you look even more closely, I mean, these figures are very difficult to verify, but Reuters at the time uh, went out with figures stating that the total amount of Iran's monetary support to militia groups in Iraq amounted to roughly four to five million dollars a month. Now, this may sound like a lot, but if you bear in mind that the PMU, the Popular Mobilization Forces, or Popular Mobilization Units, which are now an official part of the Iraqi military and are funded by the Iraqi central government, the salaries for that, or the entire budget for that organization is three billion US dollars. So the reality is that Iran is not really funding these groups that have become self-funded a long time ago. And whatever it sends is kind of the extra, so to speak. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that these uh, 
the, the attempt to kind of cut up Iran's uh, ability to conduct its regional policy through sanctions fundamentally at the time, to me at least, didn't make much sense because it was kind of like trying to uh, kill a mosquito with a hammer, so to speak. And um, another, I think, a dynamic to look at reference to sanctions is, again, if the declared objective is to um, reduce Iranian influence in the region, get it to shift its policies, what sanctions really have achieved so far is that they have fundamentally forced Iran to double down on the region. And the reasons are quite simple. If you are robbed of access to the international banking system of uh, shipping, insurance, the basic logistics to be able to move uh, services, goods around the world, what you are forced to do is to turn to your immediate physical neighbors. And we have seen, again, shifts in trading patterns that indicate that the precise opposite of the declared intention of the sanction uh, has been achieved. Um, in November 2019, I believe, Iraq became uh, Iran's biggest non-oil export partner, even bigger than China at the time, although China kind of reclaimed that, that role a few months later. But this is quite remarkable. And we don't just have similar kind of uh, cooperation with, with Iraq. We also have similar kind of outreach with Afghanistan, although that has, of course, with the takeover of the Taliban, shifted things quite a lot. And we did cover some of uh, the recent trade arrangements that being set up in Amwaj yesterday, if you want to check that out. Um, so going back to the actual, again, what's the purpose of these sanctions? Is to get Iran out of the region, get it to behave differently in the region. And we've seen that, no, it actually forced Iran to double down in the region. And because most of these groups are self-funded, or they're not fully reliant on Iranian money, we've seen that it hasn't really changed any of the policy. And I think there are other two additional factors to keep in mind, purely from a data-driven point of view. Uh, and I think those are the technological deficiencies versus uh, advances since the initiation of the US sanctions regime or the stepping up of it in 2010 uh, under Obama. So one of the things that uh, Iran really sought to invest in and really expand under the Khatami era in the early 2000s was LNG, liquefied natural gas. Iran is the uh, second biggest holder of natural gas reserves in the world after Russia, and it shares the huge uh, South Park slash North Dome field with Qatar. Right now, especially as you see the spot prices LNG reaching historic highs, you should know that Iran is not gaining one cent from any of that. And the reason is quite simple. The LNG trains that are necessary to be able to initiate any LNG project at the time were not accessible to Chinese companies, which were the only ones active in Iran. And they later also quit Iran because of US sanctions. So Iran has no LNG capacity whatsoever today. This has forced it to rely on physical connections. What I mean by physical connections, I'm talking about gas pipelines. So Iran presently, its main gas export partners are Turkey and Iraq. Reference to Turkey, we've seen a major drop in exports for political reasons, for reasons to do with payment of the gas because of US sanctions, and most of all because of domestic shortages in Iran this summer. We've seen an um, increase in uh, drought, we've seen, which has also necessi necessitated higher uh, power kind of uh, usage. Uh, we've also seen uh, much higher consumption, not just of gas, but also of gasoline, which is another point I want to get to. So as a result of all of these kinds of factors, we've seen that, of course, these climatic considerations are not limited by national borders. The same drought that has hit Iran has also hit Iraq. So what do we see? We've seen this past few months that Iran has been forced to cut off gas exports to Iraq. And what's the cascade effect of that? Roughly 30 to 40% of Iraq's electricity output um, is generated by Iranian natural gas which feeds Iraqi power plant. So if you, there's a lot of talk about Iranian electricity exports to Iraq, but the reality is that that only constitutes about 10% uh, of, of Iraq's power supply. The vast proportion, 30, 40% actually comes from Iranian gas, which feeds Iraqi power plants, which are also uh, upgraded by Iranian contractors, right? So it's a kind of complicated mechanism there. And Iraq, A, has not received this gas because Iran itself has needed it. This is number one. And two, Iraq hasn't paid up. I mean, by the admission of a senior Iraqi official, former senior Iraqi official I spoke with a couple of months ago at the height of this crisis, and he, he flat out said to me, we're the worst customers because, because we don't pay on time. And when we do, we do it in kind or whatever form. So we understand that. And beyond that, what's really important to keep in mind is that Iranian officials have long stated to the Iraqi counterparts that you cannot rely on us forever. 
our own domestic consumption is increasing and we can't keep this up. You need to wean yourself off. This has been a clear message from you on. And this is really important to keep in mind because it completely clashes with the public narrative uh, in, in the media, kind of, which argues that Iran wants to keep Iraq dependent. Iran is playing with the supply to kind of force institute political change, et cetera. But the reality, again, is if you look at the internal drought in Iran, internal consumption, what's been happening over the summer has little to do with politics and all to do with data uh, and climate. And finally, another thing I'd like to state, or not finally, but another thing I'd like to state is um, gasoline. So in 2010, when the uh, Obama administration decided to increase its uh, sanctions pressure on Iran, uh, one of the decisions was to very controversially go after Iran's gasoline imports. Um, you know, Iran is a, has long been a major oil exporter. Um, at the time, Iran's crude oil exports amounted to about 2.5 million barrels a day. Yet, Iran was importing 40% of its gasoline. And the bill for this come, came up to about $6 billion a year, which is remarkable. And Iran is not the only country, not the only major oil exporter engaged in this kind of behavior. We've seen Nigeria, which is the only other country which also uh, imports about seven to $8 billion worth of gasoline every year, even though it's a major oil exporter. So what happened as a result of that was that um, when Rouhani took office in 2013, about 20% of Iran's gasoline production um, was not met by domestic supply. So they were forced to rely on imports, and this led to some drastic measures. For instance, under the Ahmadinejad era, uh, prior to 2013, I remember that winter because I was in Tehran, there was some talk of them having to turn to petrochemical plants to convert to gasoline production, and it was, it was terrible, the quality of it, the, the, the environmental effects, the health effects. But again, it really shifted behavior in Iran. And just like Iran doubled down on the region rather than giving up on the region, Iran invested massively in expansion of refining capacity, which had long been planned but never implemented. So as a result of particularly the upgrades at the Tehran refinery and also at the Persian Gulf style complex in the south of the country, Iran in 2019 became a net oil exporter of gasoline. Now, in past months, Iran has cut off exports again to fill inventory and because of domestic considerations. But the reality is that right now, a key driver of revenue for Iran is not oil exports. I would say, I mean, Bijan can correct me on this, but my own estimates, if we come up with a figure of about $45 billion a year, potential gasoline exports annually, that's about 30% of what Iran makes from crude oil sales, right? So that's quite significant. And the one big difference between selling gasoline and selling crude oil is you can do it over land. You can do it to your neighbors. Your main markets are, in fact, your neighbors. So there's a lot of attention being paid to, for instance, what Iran sends to Venezuela, but that's a very small portion compared to what it ships to, for instance, Afghanistan or, or to uh, Iraq or even what to Turkey and Pakistan where it smuggles. And I know my time's up, so I'm going to stop here. There's much more to talk about, and, uh, and I'll hand over to Bijan for now. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Mohammed. I mean, I think what you're describing actually is really a, a whole lot of uh, opportunity cost that Iran has willingly accepted. Right. And so a two hundred billion dollar loss from the impact of sanctions didn't necessarily change things. Right. So it must have been worthwhile. But it's also opportunity cost in terms of developing its LNG market and you know, getting access to to capital, to investment. And who wants to be in a gasoline business when you can be in the LNG business? Right. So that's a real you know, that's that's a missed opportunity. But but Bijan, I turn to you and to your presentation and give us more a little bit of the um, uh, the facts on of, of these scenarios of what the outlook might be going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will share my screen uh, so that I can share some of the graphs I have uh, prepared. Just uh, before I get to my own uh, presentation, uh, just one uh, small uh, addition to what Mohammed said. It's not just gasoline alone. It's all types of petroleum products. I mean, it's also diesel. Diesel is a major uh, fuel that's being exported, uh, LPG and, and, and others. So um, uh, it's true, I always say that it's true that Iran has lost out on exporting crude oil, but it has gained in exporting petroleum products, which have potentially more value add economically, also in terms of jobs and, and so on. And as Mohammed said, you can more easily export them to your immediate neighbors. So what I will try to achieve in the next 10 minutes is I'll very quickly give you a snapshot of the Iranian economy, uh, identify the trends, which are all more or less consequences of the sanctions regime over the past three years, uh, 
and then look forward, look at the next four, five years um, and, and play three different scenarios. An optimistic scenario, uh, which is becoming more and more uh, unlikely is that the sanctions are lifted. A middle scenario, there could be an interim deal where some of the sanctions are lifted. And then the pessimistic scenario is a continuation of status quo. Let's just see what all these th three scenarios would mean for the Iranian economy. So some basic facts, uh, some of them unknown. Uh, for example, Karen mentioned that uh, the Iranian economy is very diversified. This is, these are the figures from the last Iranian year, which ended in March 2021. 54% of the Iranian economy, of the Iranian GDP was, was services. And obviously you have a lot more resilience and a lot more flexibility in a service-based economy compared to a petroleum. And in fact, look at the petroleum sector in the past Iranian year, only 5% of the GDP. Obviously the, the sanctions effect has had a lot to do with that. And I can tell you that this Iranian year, uh, the petroleum sector will return to about 10% of the GDP if, if my calculations are correct. Some other aspects, uh, inflation extremely high. We will get back to the inflation. Uh, this Iranian year, it's projected to be about 40%, but the GDP is, is growing again, about 2% growth this Iranian year. And I will share the, the, the overall GDP um, development in a minute. But another factor that's important that also helps, uh, on the one side helps with the resilience of the economy, but also creates challenges like employment challenge is the demography. Look at the demography of the country. Uh, uh, it's it's not, not anymore the youngest population in the Middle East, but it's still a very young population. And that obviously brings with it potential for um, entrepreneurship, for, for startups and so on, which is also helping with the economic activity. So um, continuing with the snapshot, uh, as I said, uh, the GDP declined for two years in a row. In fact, between 2018 and 2019, the Iranian economy uh, contracted by about 12%, which is huge. Um, that's also partly the calculation that leads to that $200 billion of, uh, of uh, compensation that Iran has asked for. But the interesting thing is that in the last Iranian year, the economy started growing again, very marginally, but it grew by 0.7%. And as I mentioned in the current Iranian year, which will go end March, 2022, the economy is projected to grow by about 2%. The, the really uh, uh, sort of challenging indicators are inflation, which is around 40%. And, and as I will share with you in a minute, it's not going to go down very fast. Um, and unemployment, even though unemployment trends have been positive. This is very interesting. Now to underline that the economy is growing again, just a quick look at these um, uh, quarterly growth path. Uh, since the economy has come out of decline, since sort of the second quarter of 2020, the last quarter uh, has had the highest growth, a 6% growth annualized. And that's important. That shows that the economy is, is, is sort of coming out of the decline phase and is starting to grow despite the sanctions and despite all the different structural problems we have. One graph that is interesting to look at is exchange rates since it became clear that the US will withdraw from the JCPOA in, in 2018. What I wanna show you here is the, the impact of psychological uh, developments. You can see, if you can see my arrow, you can see how in the run-up to the U.S. elections in November uh, 2020, how the psychological impact of potentially a Trump attack on Iran or even a Trump re-election sort of dropped, devalued the Iranian, the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian currency, the real, and how after the election of President Biden, things sort of calmed down. And there, here we, we had the hope that maybe the US and Iran will find a path to sort of uh, uh, rejoin the JCPOA, revive the JCPOA. And then you can see obviously the different fluctuations with events and so on. I'm 
one thing I want to mention here is that one of the goals of the new government in Iran is try to, uh, trying to um, create positive news. You saw the hype about the Iranian membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Economically, that has no value right now. It's not, not even final yet, but psychologically, it has a value. And, and you will see a lot of psychological sort of uh, uh, impulses that will go trying to, um, to sort of improve the economic conditions through psychological um, factors. Now, a, a couple of other important um, uh, data to look at. One is capital flight. The capital account in Iran has been negative uh, since uh, basically the JCPOA collapsed in a way. In, uh, so it, the only two years where there was a positive capital account were the years when the JCPOA was signed and when the JCPOA was implemented. Ever since, an, an average of probably $10 billion a year of capital is leaving Iran. This, these are people migrating. These, this is industrial, inter, industrialists shifting their, their funds outside the country. Uh, and, and obviously it's bad news because it's eroding the economic substance of Iran. The other factor to look at is where do the government revenues come from? Because obviously one of the impacts of lower oil revenues for the economy is also lower income for the um, for the government. You can see how uh, the tax revenues have, have increased over the past few years, um, how petroleum revenues have shrunk, but how the government has tried to fill the gap through additional privatization. We have had a second wave of privatization. Uh, the, the, the reason I mentioned this is that something like that you can do for a couple of years but well, you're not going to be able to sustain that for a decade. So these are sort of um, instruments to fill the gaps, but they are not going to be sustainable if the sanctions are not lifted. I, I, when we get to the um, economic outlook, which is now, uh, you ha we have to consider that. So remember three scenarios. Optimistic scenario is the JCPOA is revived. Uh, middle scenario is only some of the sanctions are lifted because of an interim deal. And a pessimistic scenario is uh, there will be uh, no sanctions released and, and Iran will have to deal with the current situation. Uh, you can see the differences, basically the GDP growth, sanctions, if sanctions get lifted within a couple of years, Iran will get to a, a, a GDP growth of about six to 7% a year, which is good. Uh, it should be higher if they want to really address un unemployment, but even six, seven percent is, is great because there could also be additional gains through efficiency growth and so on. Middle scenario, we are looking at maybe a growth of about uh, three to four <clears> percent. <throat> and in the pessimistic scenario, the, the marginal growth will continue for a couple of years, but then Iran will slip into marginal decline. What is important to, to know, it won't collapse. I can tell you that I said that in 2017, 18 as well. And we saw that it's not going, it's not an economy that will collapse easily. It has a lot of resilience and flexibility, but it cannot uh, produce the type of growth that's needed for Iran to achieve its own goals. Iran has a goal. Iran wants to be the largest economy of the Middle East by 2025, obviously, we are going to miss that, um, that target and, and it's important to, un to understand the implications. Petroleum exports, you can imagine obviously sanctions lifted, Iran can very quickly go back to where it was in 2016 after the implementation of the JCPOA by about 2.5 to 2.8 million barrels a day of um, crude and condensate. But as I said, the, the new element now is that there will be more petroleum products as well. The other two scenarios, Iran will sort of muddle through, um, but again, it's not going to generate enough revenues. And as I said, the government cannot necessarily fill the gap uh, with other instruments. They have started thinking about other instruments. For example, one is um, uh, the lifting of subsidies. That will make a huge difference for government finances, but it will also have a very negative impact on the society. So there will be costs uh, 
involved in other scenarios. Um, inflation, obviously, if, uh, if, Iran, if the Iranian government, and not just the government, Iranian government, banks, companies, and so on, can access their internationally stranded um, assets, it will fill some of the gaps. It will fill the, the budget deficit, which is the biggest driver of inflation right now. Uh, but inflation is not going to uh, go back to where it was in 2017. Uh, at the end of the first term of per President Rouhani, inflation was about 7% in Iran. I don't see that very quickly because there are too many structural issues. We have a, uh, as I said, budget deficit issue. We have a money supply issue. We have a banking structure issue. So there are lots of, things. that's why the, 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 even the optimistic scenario for inflation is, is about 20%, but a pessimistic one will re remain around 40%. Unemployment, obviously, if, if sanctions are lifted and some foreign investment flows come into the country and the government can start investing in infrastructure, because that has really not taken place for the past three years because of the budget deficit, then it will create jobs, even though I have to say uh, the job creation uh, trends in Iran have been more positive than anyone had expected. And that is partly because of import substitution. Obviously, the domestic industry is more and more active. It has a vivid domestic market. It has a regional market. Uh, and those trends could continue. But as I said, the, 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 the return of Iran, in Iran's international assets will be an important element to really sustain some of these positive trends. So let me conclude. I mentioned Iran, uh, the Iranian economy declined heavily for two years. It has come out now. It, it's achieving some marginal growth, uh, but the growth pattern cannot be sustained uh, if the sanctions are not lifted. On the other side, the economy is not going to collapse easily. It will sort of sustain itself at marginal growth, but it will lead to a lot of socioeconomic issues from employment, unemployment, uh, capital flight, brain drain, and so on. Uh, and that's why if the sanctions are not lifted, addressing some of the domestic impediments to economic growth, the business climate, corruption, mismanagement, et cetera, et cetera, will be extremely important. Um, and, and that is, I don't see that political will right now but maybe they are hoping that sanctions will be lifted and then will make decisions if there is no agreement to return to the JCPOA. I'll stop here and look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Bijan. That is a really comprehensive and a lot of good, uh, good information that you've shared with us. I think what strikes me in, in your presentation and also in the article that we've uh, put up on the, the website just today is this issue of a government that is capital starved, very, very loose monetary policy, um, and really no mention, nobody's talked about COVID and the government's ability to provide stimulus, right? And recovery, which is what the rest of the world is, is focused on and talking about. So it's really a, a hampering of, um, of the government's response mechanism, which I think is, is quite severe in this recovery, which is from an extremely low base, right? Um, so I wanna pass to Rachel now and, and understand a little bit more about um, what kinds of sanctions are in place? What is the capacity for maybe even additional sanctions if we get into a, um, a worst case scenario uh, for Iran? Um, you know, what, what is your outlook there, Rachel? Thanks very much, Karen. And, and thanks to, to Bijan and, and Mohammed. Um, the nice thing about going third is I can reinforce some points and uh, um, just sort of pick up on some of the good points that, that, that you've mentioned. So what I want to talk about in my few minutes is sort of provide a little more differentiation in the sanctions, picking up on what some of Mohammed laid out on the energy sector. Um, also, what the Biden administration has been doing to tweak the sanctions apparatus, both uh, some additions, but some subtractions. And I will talk about COVID there, Karen. Um, and then also what we might be seeing going forward. And my big takeaway, I think, to pick up on something Bijan concluded with and had throughout his remarks is to highlight that they're important policy choices that the Iranian, the Iranian government continues to make. Um, and that that in turn is going to frame what 
how banks respond, how others respond, even if there is some a, a sort of a broader sanctions relief. So, and I'm looking particularly around the banks, around uh, issues of corruption, but also how the government uses that fiscal space, which is not great now, but there, there is some. I mean, my work over the last, I don't know, decade or so focused on Iran and other oil exporters has tended to emphasize that um, most, and, you know, Iran, uh, you know, Iran may not sort of, um, you know, Iran under sanctions has uh, survived. It hasn't necessarily thrived. There've been difficult choices made along those dynamics. Just to step back and put in context, Iran remains one of the most sanctions country, sanctioned countries in the world. It rivals Russia with the number of sanctions entities, individuals. And I'm drawing here on data that my Center for New American Security colleagues collect. It all comes from the US Treasury. Um, but of course, Iran, uh, those sanctions cover a much wider swath of the economy. There are countries like Cuba and even Venezuela who have maybe even more of the economy constrained, but we're looking at an environment where all the major banks are cut off from um, financial systems, where there's a need for a lot of creative accounting to engage in trade. And this has meant that even legal trade, humanitarian trade has been very difficult. Um, so the challenge I think ahead, and one of the things that's complicating discussions uh, on, the, on, on the JCPOA is that you have various different trigger points for, for sanctions. Mohammed rightly highlighted the regional role, um, but when we look at it and where Iran and the US are differing now and in the past, there's also been the fact that you have sanctions against the, Iran's nuclear program. You have sanctions that are targeting uh, counter terror, you know, support of uh, terrorist organizations. You have those that are, uh, you know, Magnitsky sanctions. You have uh, quite a wide range, plus also a deeper global apparatus around, um, around money laundering issues. And so one of the risks, and in this period where the Trump administration was, was going to maximum pressure sanctions, you had a dynamic not only were more entities listed, but some entities were relisted for different reasons. So some of the challenge for uh, global banks and others, even in the case of sanctions relief, would be figuring out whether they were still targeted sanctions. So we can get into some of the details on that in the q and I don't want to lead us too far down a rabbit hole. So what's the, the Biden administration done on sanctions policy? Not a lot. Um, they have kept almost all the Trump administration measures in place. They've added some regional san you know, sanctions. Um, they've also more recently uh, targeted an oil smuggling ring out of Oman, but involving other Asian players. Um, the other thing they've done, and I would be someone who'd say they should do even more of this, is that they've done some targeted delistings and some selective waivers, particularly trying to avoid making the humanitarian situation worse. Um, and that's something not unique to Iran. This is something across the board. The Biden administration is trying to target sanctions better. We can debate um, how effective that's been, but there have been a few targeted waivers that make it clear that so COVID related health and equipment is not supposed to be uh, subject to sanctions. Now, NGOs would tell you it's still very hard to access the money and the like, but there is, um, there is a policy attempt to make that easier and to avoid punishing the population as much. Um, and, and I think it's just important to watch that because even those targeted measures they highlight how difficult it can be um, to access financing, even unless there's an affirmative um, mechanism that facilitates it, perhaps from the US and other, other players. So um, they've also delisted a few people that have retired from Iran's national oil company, but that's more, uh, you know, that's sort of cleaning up the sanctions list, not anything else. So looking ahead, um, you know, I think it's important to look at what are some of the elements of sanctions and sanctions relief that are sort of on the table or being debated about. First, and, and maybe most important to certain actors in Iran is access to the frozen assets, which both uh, Bijan and Mohammed alluded to. These are assets, particularly in Asian banks abroad, Japan, South Korea, countries where Iran struggled to find enough 
goods to buy or uh, those Japanese and Korean banks said, oh, I, I don't want to be subject to sanctions. Um, and so those, it's very clear without a phone call from the treasury or sort of uh, clear um, access, uh, th those assets are gonna be difficult to access. Um, then of course, there is a whole debate within Iran that we can talk about, about um, whether the focus is repatriation or buying additional goods, um, that's a different issue. The bigger piece of course though is uh, lifting and, and not just suspending, but lifting the energy sanctions, the restrictions on energy trade, which would not only allow uh, growth in the energy sector and greater revenues, but it would also allow um, less money to be paid to counterparts and middlemen and shell companies that are currently the way, for example, Iran is getting its oil to, to China. Um, a context of sanctions is that Iran ends up being more, more price, you know, sort of taker in some of these markets. Um, and then, of course, Iran is requesting all, all of the sort of new sanctions be lifted, and that would include a lot of other sectors. Um, um, the other panelists have highlighted areas of resilience, sort of uh, loopholes, a variety of other areas. These are drivers of resilience, but these choices um, come with costs. I want to just conclude with a brief sort of I guess, amendment or more details to some of Bijan's scenarios with which I generally agree, um, including the fact that that optimistic scenario <laughs> is, is receding. In my mind, a key part of that optimistic scenario would not only involve broad lifting of sanctions, but also would involve certain domestic choices within Iran to take most advantage of it and to make sure it wasn't just the oil sector that was benefiting. So that would include measures to align with FATF and um, the like. So, but, you know, sort of this middle tier, most pragmatic, optimistic one is maybe a partial deal, access to some assets, phased reentry, um, and some greater ability to pay for goods. Two risks are implicit in this scenario. One is that growth might be primarily on the energy side, and it might actually discourage some of the other reforms. Um, and I'm looking at other energy producing countries for examples of that. Number two, unless there's some sort of positive affirmative um, efforts to establish banking channels, um, then there might well be a lot of companies and banks in Europe and uh, Asia that might be reluctant to take on that risk. That's partly a fear of what could happen if there's a reimposition of sanctions, but also all those domestic issues. Now then we, uh, I shouldn't end on a negative note, um, but the no deal scenario, um, is one in which current sanctions, you know, remain. Some loopholes might be closed. The, the U.S. has threatened publicly to clamp down on uh, trade with, with China. In my mind, those measures are a little bit of a restatement of policy rather than a new policy. And they're really designed in part to sort of try to get uh, both Iran back to the table, but a response to the fact that the U.S. and Europe feel that China has been a bit AWOL in recent um, uh, discussions, something we can we can uh, discuss. Um, so, but in my mind, there are not a lot of new en entities to target. Now, we've highlighted the sort of non-oil petroleum complex as maybe an area of resilience, but a lot of that trade is regional. And as we've noted, it's hard to pay for those things. So, I don't think there's a lot of scope for much tighter um, sanctions, and that might end up being uh, counterproductive in my view. So all of this comes back to the fact that even in this scenario where policy space is constrained for Iran, there's still an important role. And that's where, for example, in my mind, it's been very interesting to read more about, for example, the new central bank governor um, announced who has an interesting range of expertise and really to watch whether the government is going to move from these sort of announcements of trade with Asia and neighbors to measures that are going to improve the outlook for the Iranian private sector. And that's going to be important under any of these scenarios. So I'll conclude there and look forward to the rest of the discussion. That's great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, for our viewers, you are welcome to put a question into the Q&A function 
on Zoom. If you're watching via YouTube, you can email a question to events at mei.edu. I'm going to take advantage of a moderator's privilege and, and pose a question to, uh, to Mohammed, um, and then I have one for each of you if we have time. Um, but I want to get back, as Rachel was kind of getting towards, you know, domestic economic policy. You know, what does this government really want to achieve? Is economic growth a priority? How do you generate other forms of government revenue? Obviously, subsidy reductions would come at a political cost. Bijan has written about and Amwash has covered um, the notion of, uh, of uh, basically privatization and, and the um, giving of shares to citizens, justice shares in uh, publicly held companies. Um, but, you know, as Bijan says, there are only so many things you can do um, in this limited fiscal space to, um, to generate uh, to generate more uh, more revenue for the government. So, so Mohammed, what is what do you see? I mean, you follow the government very closely as sort of economic policy priorities. Where are there potential um, avenues for more revenue generation or for more productivity generation? Um, where where are they going to go? Thank you, Karen, uh, for an excellent question. I just want to very quickly. Uh, raise one vital point, and it goes back to what I said earlier about the region, and that is the fact that in September 2020, unless I'm mistaken, or was it September 2019? I believe it was September 2020. For the first time, the U.S. Treasury sanctioned the Quds Force and Hezbollah for smuggling oil. And it was quite remarkable to me because before the maximum pressure campaign, the Quds Force was not in the business of, of selling oil. They had no reason to be. And suddenly they were. And another important data point related to that is uh, the former foreign minister Zarif's testimony before parliament, where he criticized what he referred to as the 16 percenters. The 16 percent refers to the commission charged by the current middlemen uh, who run Iran's economy, uh, a lot of Iran's trade with the world. So it's the reason I bring this up is because it's important to keep in mind that each of these sanctions create a new political economy and new dependencies. And it's not as easy as switching off a button and everything goes back to the way things were. The 16 percenters are gonna to continue to want their cut and it's not gonna be very easy to get rid of them. Um, going back to another important point that raised, and Rachel also raised, and that was the fact that right now in Iran, the Iran is uh, assets rich, but it is uh, starved of access to these assets, right? So Iran's issue right now is accessible for an exchange. Um, having said that, the amount of foreign exchange that the government itself really requires is quite low. Uh, Bijan, I believe last year you put out an estimate of about six to eight billion dollars worth of FX reserves uh, that they needed every year annually, and most of this is accessible through northern Iraq and Afghanistan. Obviously, the Taliban situation has complicated things a little bit, but fundamentally, I think things haven't really changed on that end. And going back to, again, tying all of this into what does Raisi want? What's his actual point? What's his policy? I think his policy will be to pursue. He understands very well that Iran's economic priority must be continuation of Rouhani did, which is trade with neighbors. Number one, first and foremost. Although he hails the uh, SCO membership, again, that's a at least two year accession process. And beyond that, SCO is a political organization. Its main purpose is to identify geopolitical enemies or domestic enemies jointly. And if you want to look at the economic dimension to trade with Eurasia or China or Central Asia, you would rather look at the Eurasian Economic Union. And actually just today, or yesterday, I'm sorry, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, who met with the Iranian Foreign Minister in Moscow, said that there are efforts being made to make permanent the current interim free trade deal uh, between Iran and the Eurasian Economic Union. But even if you do that and you look at the actual stats, 2019 trade between Iran and the Eurasian Economic Union the majority of which is Russia, is only about $3 billion a year. It's nowhere near enough. Iran can't, that's, that's not the way Israel is going to run the economy. That's not the way he's going to move forward. So he understands that he needs the cash injections. And right now, the most immediate way to get that are twofold. One is exactly what you brought up, IMF. IMF right now has $50 billion that they put aside for support, COVID support for middle-income countries, Iran argues that it's entitled to one-tenth of this amount. It's about $5 billion. And they have pushed and pushed and pushed. Even under Biden, since he took office in January, nothing has materialized. But one cent. Beyond the $5 billion itself, Iran is also arguing that he wants to 
accesses SDRs, the sovereign drawing rights, which are estimated to be about 2.5, unless I'm wrong. So in total, that would be about $7.5 billion. Again, mindful of what's Iran's actual oil revenues right now, which constitute about a third of the central government budget, between 10 to $12 billion. So if you look at the possible routes ahead, we will be looking at a situation where Iran would have a great interest in freeing up access to its foreign exchange reserves as a very quick and easy fix to a lot of the issues that they have. Two is access not just to IMF monetary support in the form of the $5 billion, but also the SDRs. And none of these has happened. And I think, uh, again, going beyond all of this, if you look at the big picture, and I may sound uh, contradictive here, Iran's economy is very diversified, but oil is still king. And I'll give you one specific example of this. In 2016, when Iran uh, implemented the JCPOA, we saw a growth of about, I think, 12% that year. But if you look at the close kind of details of the figures, you see that non-oil growth was also, well, at that year, was 0.5%. It barely moved. So it's not that Iran has a totally oil-dependent economy, but rather oil engines that really powers much of the rest, especially investment. So uh, we need to really keep this in mind. So again, if you ask me, what is Raisi trying to achieve here? What does he want to do? The simple answer is much of what Rouhani wanted to do. And what Rouhani wanted to do was to engage with, with neighbors, not because he genuinely wanted it, he much preferred Western companies and Western investment, but he had no choice. And the simple reason for this is because Iran was robbed of access to international banking system, international markets, physically, because it couldn't access, for instance, shipping, insurance, things to basically physically, how do you move a good or service? How do you sell a good or service to a client on the other side of the world? How does it actually work? If you get down to the practical details of it, the reality is that Iran is now left with no choice but to double down in the region. And again, even with the SCO, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it does not have the economic dimensions to it. And importantly, even if it did, the reality is that SCO since 2010 allows its member states to basically refuse accession to any state on the basis of UN sanctions, right? That's another thing to consider here. We have US sanctions and then we have UN Security Council sanctions. Uh, JCPOA was endorsed by UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which was adopted in September 2015, right? That one, what, it, what, what that resolution achieved was to lift the prior six sanctions, six sets of UN Security Council, so UN Security Council uh, sanctions imposed against Iran under Obama. If the JCPOA were to collapse or if the dispute resolution mechanism were to be activated in the absence of any deal, we could very well see a return of a so-called snapback. And that can have unpredictable consequences. So if you ask me, in fact, one of the likely, I think, Russian gambits, very intelligent, I would say, on the part of the Russians, was to open space for Iranian conservatives domestically to pursue a harder line against the US by giving them uh, political capital at the SCO. The reason why Iran was not granted membership in the organization, and it still hasn't been, it, the process has just begun. It will take at least two years, was Tajikistan. So who leaned on Tajikistan most likely? We all know the answer to that. So if they want to push, press Iran to feel more empowered to be tougher at the negotiating table, and at the same time, mindful that without, with UN sanctions, none of that materializes, not the SCO membership on any of the trade, not even with China. So these are really important dyna dynamics to think of. And I feel that there's a very high danger of Russia prodding kind of Iran in a certain direction and very highly aware of where it may lead. And it will benefit from it either way. So I think, uh, again, going back to your actual question, Raisi is Rouhani 2.0 in many ways, in many ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. That's going to be um, an interesting comment to digest here in Washington. I don't think that's the sentiment, but you make a strong argument. Um, we have some great questions in the Q&A function. You can all see them. I want to go to... Um, uh, to Bijan on this question of, of Iran's trade partners, really what, also what Mohammed was talking about. I mean, this sort of eastward look, certainly China is very important. Um, what's the risk of you know, a downturn in China to Iran? I mean, China is going to be buying oil, certainly cheaper oil as for as long as it can. So I don't know if that's such a risk. But um, and, and then, you know, these, these kind of other um, regional trade opportunities, is that window closing or can it be expanded? Um, Rachel, there's a question for you on uh, kind of enforcement mechanisms in the Biden administration, um, which you touched on a little, but maybe you could say a bit more. 
Um, and then um, Alia has a question on um, sanctions lifting scenarios for Mohammed and the gas sector um, of the uh, shared field with Qatar. What's, uh, what's movement there? Is, is there any opportunity for financing available to Iran? So let's start with uh, Bijan. Uh, just to be clear, do you want me to go through the questions that are in the questions or just answer the one you mentioned? Just, just the question on sort of on trade the, partners and potential okay. um, areas okay. of, of access to finance okay. or, or sure, opportunity. Sure. Um, it's, it's, there is no doubt that, uh, let's say, a, a downturn in China uh, will have an impact on, on the Iranian economy. But we should not forget that uh, the Chinese approach to Iran uh, has not been uh, to maximize the, the potential in the trade between Iran and China. It has been to sort of facilitate Chinese exports to Iran. Don't forget, I mean, Chinese exports to Iran will have to be financed in a way through Iranian exports to China. And obviously Iranian exports to China are in, in, and in some cases indirectly uh, crude oil and condensate and, and petrochemicals. So um, if, if there is a downturn, China would actually have uh, an incentive to increase trade with Iran because the potential is there. Uh, China could theoretically export even more to Iran, but it has to make sure that there are there is a sort of some some degree of balanced trade. And, and I think in that, depending on the dynamics in China, and I'm not a China expert, uh, we will have to watch how it it will have an impact on Iran. But what we have to watch right now on multiple levels is Iran's interaction with the Eurasian Economic Union that is led by Russia. I mean, that's that's really the growth story of Iranian exports and Iranian trade. And on top of everything else, a potential um, platform for financial interactions. In fact, Iran and Russia are working on connecting their banking messaging systems to each other so that they, they, they can work independently of SWIFT and international messaging systems to, to sort of facilitate um, local currency trade between Iranian and Russian companies. And I think there will be some, um, some new opportunities, uh, both with, uh, with the Eurasian uh, Economic Union, but also uh, with maybe other um, Asian uh, uh, economies. And, and that, that is, uh, that is def definitely a story in Iran. In fact, the Iranians have learned from this uh, sort of bitter experience with, with sanctions, especially banking sanctions, and they have been looking for, for alternatives, whether it's joint banks, uh, uh, for example, Iran-Iraq Bank, uh, even though it's not optimized yet, but, but it's, it's moving uh, along, or with um, a, a more sophisticated barter uh, uh, trade approach. Uh, and and I, I, I think under the Raisi government, we will see a lot more attempts to, uh, to pave the way for barter. The Rouhani government uh, was hesitant. They would insist on uh, sort of separating the transactions uh, and not really driving a barter trade. Uh, but Raisi and co, I think, will move in that direction, because uh, especially if sanctions are not lifted, uh, not many choices will, will be there. Uh, I want to just make one additional point to the, the comments by, by Mohammed, what Raisi uh, plans to do in terms of filling the, the financial gap. It's very interesting that Raisi, in two different uh, press conferences, without being prompted, uh, or without being asked, started commenting on the potential of the Iranian diaspora uh, and the potential sort of flow of investment from the Iranian diaspora towards Iran. There is no doubt that there is a huge potential. Right now, it's actually working in the other direction. As I showed, the capital flight is related, obviously, to migration of many Iranians out. But obviously, if the if the situation changes, the legal situation of the Iranian diaspora, the political conditions, business climate, and so on, there, there could be a potential, especially considering the, the fact that uh, there are not that many investment opportunities internationally. The fact is that would also require 
a, a huge political will, maybe even an amnesty, a, a sort of general amnesty by the Iranian authorities. So it is something that I think they are considering. I have also heard from someone very well informed this week that uh, they are thinking about a general uh, uh, amnesty, but it will obviously require a lot more. I mean, first of all, they have to stop arresting dual citizens and, and harassing dual citizens, uh, but also really changing a number of realities in the Iranian business climate. But I just wanted to mention that this is something on the radar as well. I'll stop here. Thank you, Bijan. Yeah, and I'm glad you added that on the uh, the arrest of dual nationals, because I think that certainly is an element of the, the trust deficit right now. Um, Rachel, the question on um, uh, on enforcement, but also Mohammed's mm -hmm. point and the point that's come up about Russia as an avenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, as you said before, two very highly sanctioned countries. So what happens if they uh, gang up together? What will the U.S. reaction be? Yeah, and, and, and throwing China in the mix there is, as well. I mean, we can't necessarily call China highly sanctioned, but we can call it a um, on enforcement. Definitely, as the, the commentator mentioned, the U.S. could do more. And it's notable, um, in my view, that the timing of the enforcement action on this sort of Oman nexus uh, smuggling ring came in this period of time where Iran had moved away from talks and the like. And that timing, in my view, is not uh, coincidental. Um, but I would point back to a comment that Mohammed made, which is that there are uh, unintended consequences of tighter sanctions. And those include pushing things farther into the deep corners of the global economy. They include um, greater involvement of entities that themselves don't touch the global financial system as much, including these regional organizations, but also uh, layers and layers of shell companies that are harder, but not impossible for the U.S. Treasury to target. So I think we will see uh, targets closing, uh, loopholes closing. Um, but it's important to remember that the further entities move from touching the global financial system, the harder it is for the U.S. to use what are, in fact, I would say, blunt, you know, blunt instruments. Um, and then, you know, there's sort of this question of what are the additional power sort of points. Now, that leads us in an interesting way to this question about, about Russia, um, particularly from a payment system direction. And one of the things, not in the short term, but over the next several years that I'm watching very closely is both Russia's development of greater interbank systems that allow Russian entities to bypass SWIFT, similar things, but slightly different that the Chinese are trying to do. Um, that's the Chinese, I would say, are much more focused domestically than they are around internationalization. They're in that that the domestic focus of domestic of the dual circulation policy right now for reasons that get into economic growth. But one of the potentials down the line is as some of this infrastructure is developed, um, especially relating to interbank markets, uh, these could create some channels that would um, add to sort of resilience for Iran. Now, one question and concern around Russia, of course, is that there are a number of areas where they're competitor with, uh, with Iran. They're producing some of the same products. That's not to say that they, uh, that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of geopolitical benefits to Russia for some of the things that Iran might be doing. And there are different, just like Iran, Russian political class, not very not much, not monolithic. Um, but that competition element, as opposed to being a clear buyer, um, I think it does, can complicate um, the, the, the relationship, even though they have this, this element of, of, of growth. Um, I, just really briefly, I know we're out of time, on this sort of Chinese growth point, I think a lot of the question comes down to what's going to be the driver of Chinese growth going forward. Yes, we might see less you know, infrastructure, we might see a little less energy um, reliance, but I mean, this is a country that is still likely gonna have quite a lot of demand for oil and particularly natural gas. And so to the extent that China is continuing to mandate crackdowns on coal consumption and the like, this is really a global story. Um, I think that uh, I'm, less worried about there being sort of a shock in demand and more about, you know, as Bijan highlighted and Muhammad highlighted, uh, China, China 
is going to do what's in China's interest. And so that limits how far they're willing, you know, they're balancing their relations with Iran, with their relations with Saudi Arabia, their relations with a lot of other energy and other suppliers. So I, I think their their interests line up, but um, they, at the end of the day, they're interested in, in Chinese uh, domestic interests. Thanks very much. I know I've overrun my time. That's all right, Rachel. We're going to just give it another minute or two. I want to give Mohammed the last word and give him an opportunity to answer a couple of questions about the shared um, gas field with Qatar and, and what's really going on there. If, if you have any information you want to share, Mohammed. Sure. I, I saw also another good question by um, Cyril, who asked basically um, what happens when the currently pro Iran governments, uh, if, if they lose power in places like Iraq? That was, that was a very good question. Um, I would just respond to that, that Iran presently, for the past few years, is exporting electricity to Iraq only thanks to a U.S. waiver. And that's number one. Number two, even if Iran right now has full influence in Iraq, and it's, it's kingmaker in Iraq, and he has ability to, to help select the prime minister of the country, Iraq refuses to pay up. <laughs> the reality is that Iraq owes Iran billions of dollars. They're not paying it. They refuse to pay it and they're citing sanctions. They had numerous visits between the central bank governors of the two countries. And minimal had came, has come up, out of it so far. Reference to Qatar specifically. The best of my understanding, there had been a long understanding that Qatar would kind of, uh, it had been holding off on expanding output for a variety of reasons, including for kind of Iran to kind of catch up. And in South Pars, they did good work and they have expanded out. But the reality is that I think it was about a year ago. It was about right before COVID. Um, I think I may have gone on a timeline wrong, but they basically made a big announcement. And that was that they weren't going to hold back anymore. They had bigger plans and they're going to go ahead and they're not going to look back. And, you know, they, in law, there's a concept, concept of uh, fruit from the poisonous tree. I don't think they're going to enter any kind of collaboration with Iran possible uh, on that. They have no need for it. And there's no incentive for it whatsoever. You, they don't, Iran doesn't currently have any of the technology to even extract anything remotely similar to what Qatar is doing. So there's that to consider too. And also going back to Russia, Russia right now in gas markets is a major competitor of Iran, right? In Europe and beyond that, a big thing to look at too, are two other things to look at. One is Afghanistan, the situation there, 1996, 2001, when Taliban were in power, one of the big projects that were being discussed was the TAPI pipeline, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, which is a direct competitor to the Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline. Iran has built its section 1,500 kilometers all the way to the Pakistani border. There's only a 50 kilometer section on the other side of the border in Pakistan that has yet to be built and operated. They refuse to do it, even though the contract stipulates that they are fined every single day that this section is not built and operated. Rouhani didn't cash in on any of the actually legally mandated fees, right? The penalties that Pakistan has to pay under this contract. Uh, so there's that to consider. Another thing to look at is also how Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan are working on transferring Central Asian gas reserves to Europe through Turkey and Azerbaijan. And again, there, Iran is the party losing up. So with reference to natural gas, uh, Iran is, is, is uh, the way I see it, is being surrounded now increasingly, and especially now with the Taliban next door, uh, with more and more kind of efforts to push it out of market, so to speak. So right now, Iran's only two real markets for natural gas is Turkey and Iraq. And as I explained previously, mostly for domestic reasons, Iran has, has cut itself out because they had no other option. And so I hope this makes sense. Thank you so much. That's interesting. And I wonder from a US policy perspective, if an avenue of uh, making a conciliatory gesture might be in, um, in this way and to create more of a wedge between Iran and Russia if the US wanted to, to do something in a carrot kind of maneuver. But we leave it there. I've learned a lot today. I thank you all very much for your comments and your presentation, Bijan, your article. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. It will be available um, for streaming via our YouTube channel. And we hope to do another event with Amwaj and, and cooperate with you guys again.